Next up, we are talking about uh, some additional random variables, uh, the hypergeometric and the negative binomial uh, distributions or random variables. Let's start with the hypergeometric. The hypergeometric distribution is the finite population analog to the binomial distribution. Maybe you remember me mentioning when talking about the binomial distribution that the binomial distribution is the distribution when you have an independent sequence of successes and failures, uh, of random successes and failures, they're independent, and you're counting how many successes you get in your sample. Now, if you had a finite population and you are sampling without replacement, then you are not dealing with a binomial random variable since there's a finite number of successes and a finite number of failures. So if you're counting the number of successes and failures, you need to be accounting for the fact that successes are removed from the sample as you're generating your as you're as you're generating your string and also failures. Failures are also being removed from the sample. So the random variable that you would move to instead of the binomial random variable would be the hypergeometric. So in the hypergeometric distribution, we're saying that there are going to be uh, M successes in the population. And there's also N minus M failures for a total population size of N. A sample of size little n is chosen from the sample without replacement in such a way that each subset of N elements is equally likely. Uh, so uh, that means that X will follow the hypergeometric distribution with parameters little n denoting your sample size, capital M denoting the number of successes in the population, and capital N denoting the total population size. Which means that the number of failures in the population is going to be n minus m. And be aware, of course, some, uh, some people will want to, instead of specifying the number of successes and the number of the of individuals in the population, they might decide instead to have the number of successes and the number of failures instead. And in fact, if I remember right, that is what R is doing. R parameterizes the hypergeometric distribution in terms of number of successes in the population and number of failures in the population. So always be paying attention whenever you're dealing doing anything in probability, how exactly things are being parameterized. Uh, so, I mean, if they're equivalent models, but they're written down differently. So, uh, it, it does matter. So, for an integer uh, x satisfying that uh, x is between the minimum of the sample size of the number of successes, because it's not possible to get successes exceeding uh, your uh, sample size, and it's also uh, not possible to... Uh, get more successes than are in the population and also uh, such that x is uh, greater than uh, either 0 or n minus n plus m or in other words which is that's n minus the number of failures in the population uh, whichever one of these is a uh, is a larger it, it's just a kind of a technical technicality so if x is satisfying this then the probability mass function for the hypergeometric distribution is given, that's going to be, we're going to use the letter H, X, our parameters are N, M, and N. That is going to be M choose X. That is choose the number of successes from the, uh, choose the successes from the population then choose the failures and choose enough failures such that you end up with a total sample size of n then divide by the number of ways to pick n elements from the population all right once you have this and i'm not even going to bother with writing down the cdf because you're just going to sum that up there's no simplification there's no simplifying formula or anything like that in the end, you're just going to end up adding up over the probability mass function. All right, so for the expected value, the expected value of our random variable x will be 
the sample size times the proportion of successes in the population to the total population size, uh, the variance of x will be uh, n minus n over n minus 1. So capital N minus little n over capital N minus 1. Then we have n times m over n. Uh, um, let me move this. I ran out of room. So that, that's still correct. I just ran out of room. So the variance of x is equal to n minus n over n minus 1. Uh, n times m over n. And then finally, uh, 1 minus m over n. And here's something to consider. Capital M over capital N, we could call that P. That's the proportion of successes in the population. So we actually have, uh, actually we have something very similar to what we had in the binomial case. The expected value of X is basically the same as it was in the binomial case. You just would have to compute P uh, by uh, dividing the number of successes in the sample by the population size. And the variance is also pretty similar except for this additional factor. That factor, though, as you increase your population size, assuming that the number of successes in your sample remains, like that proportion remains the same as you increase the total population size, that term would be going to 1 and thus would be negligible. And you could think that that term that I've got in red actually should be very close to one. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily say that. But it's like if, you're, if your population size overall is rather large and your uh, number of successes in the population isn't small, then and, – and that's, and that's relative to – uh, your sample size, so also your sample size should not be too large relative to the population, uh, then this additional red factor should be very close to 1, in which case your variance uh, very closely resembles what it would be in the binomial case. All right. I mentioned in discussing the binomial distribution that we actually had an example where actually the binomial distribution was inappropriate and we should be using a different distribution, specifically the hypergeometric distribution. So this will be the example where we do the right thing and when we're sampling without replacement from this giant bin of widgets, we're actually using a hypergeometric distribution to model uh, the situation. It's okay to use the binomial distribution if your sample size is small relative to the population. So in that case, we had like a, maybe there were 10,000 widgets in the bin and our sample size was four. So that would count. It's also probably going to be okay if you, you additionally need to require that the number of successes in the sample should be large relative large in the sense well like let, let's let's say that there were 10,000 widgets if there was a 1% if 1% of those widgets were defective that would be 10 th that would be 100 widgets which is reasonably large um or if we had a million widgets then that would be 10,000 defective widgets in the bin which is a ra relatively large number so if at some level the like I guess you could also say that the number of uh, working widgets is also large relative to your sample size because if one percent of those uh, ten thousand widgets were defective and your sample size was four, then things are still fine. So if you have a situation like that, you can go ahead and use the binomial distribution because the binomial 
is simpler and also maybe more well behaved <laughs> in a sense uh whereas the hyper geometric is a bit more exotic and more maybe slightly more difficult to work with uh on the other hand in this day and age where we have r to do all the hard work for us and we have very powerful computers does it really matter i don't know you could like it it, it probably doesn't matter as much i think a lot of those discussions mattered more uh back in the day when we didn't have very powerful computers and also people were relying on binomial tables that people have pre-calculated and you really can't construct equivalent tables for the hypergeometric distribution. So, all right, that aside, uh, getting actually to the problem at hand, a manufacturer of widgets sends batches of widgets in giant bins. Your company will accept a shipment of widgets if no more than 6% of widgets are defective. The procedure for deciding whether a shipment is defective is to choose four widgets from the batch at random, Without replacement, if more than one widget is defective, the batch is rejected. The batch sent contains 50 widgets. What is the probability of rejecting the batch if 6% of widgets are defective? Also compute the mean and the variance of X, the number of defective widgets in the sample under the assumption of uh, that 6% are defective. I guess we'll go ahead and compute the sample mean and variance first because the problem asked for it. And that should be uh, straightforward. The expected value of x is going to be n times m over n. But the problem actually says that under this uh, null hypothesis that 6% are defective, then m over n is equal to 0.06. So this is going to be 4 times 0.06, uh, which is equal to 0.24. So you expect 0.24 defective widgets in your sample. Uh, the variance will be uh, capital N minus little n over capital N minus 1. And then we have N M over N. And then 1 minus M over N, which will be uh, 0.24 times 0.94 times uh, we have n over n n minus n over n minus one so that's going to be uh, 50 minus 4 over 50 minus 1 and you go to your calculator and you ask it what number is that it's going to be approximately uh, 0.212 okay Maybe I should just write down x follows a hypergeometric distribution. With parameters, little n is 4, uh, big N is 50, and big M is going to be whatever satisfies this. So let's uh, replace big N with 50. So that means that big M is going to be, uh, so big uh, M is equal to 0 0.06 times 50, which will be three. So actually in this scenario, there are three defective widgets in the uh in 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 the bin and i literally just threw my pen i don't know how i managed to do that just just by being a klutz i don't know <laughs> so good job curtis good job just chuck your pen across the room or something Okay, so that means that the M parameter is going to be 3 and N will be 50. Which means that it's impossible in this scenario to get uh, 4 de defective widgets since there aren't 4 defective widgets in the bin. This is one situation where actually this upper bound would uh, make a difference. <laughs> 
and uh, anywhere where you can't evaluate the probability mass function and you don't and you weren't given a positive number, you're just going to say that the probability mass function is zero. Okay, so uh, we need the probability that the batch is rejected, and the batch is going to be rejected if uh, if uh, more than one widget has been found to be defective. So we're looking for the probability that x is greater than 1, which is 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 1, which is equal to 1 minus... All right, now we're going to use the probability mass function to uh, compute that quantity. We've got 3 choose 0, 47 choose 4, because there are 3 defective widgets in this bin and 47 non-defective widgets, divided by 50 choose 4. Plus 3 choose 1. Uh, 47 choose 3 divided by 50 choose 4. And at this point, I'm not going to go compute those numbers. I'm just going to say that this is one, uh, that this is going to be, uh, uh that, uh, this is going to be one minus. 0.986, uh, actually that's approximately true, which is equal to 0 0.014. Okay. And here's some R code, the uh, R functions for handling the hypergeometric distribution are the p are the hyper class of functions so p hyper uh, d hyper p hyper q hyper r hyper uh, those handle hypergeometric uh, random variables and do notice that these are being specified differently than how they're being specified in the textbook and in this class and in these lecture notes where you have uh, successes and you have failures rather than successes in total sample size okay uh, and this right here corresponds to M. The uh, this is uh, the uh, sample size. Actually, instead of writing S and F, I will write M and N minus M. All right. So we use P hyper to compute the probability that we want, and it gives us an, the number. Uh, I also plugged in. Uh, I also looked at what P binom would give us, and it gives us 0 0.019, which is actually quite a bit different relatively speaking, than 0.014. So the error is, like at these at, at these levels, it's it's not nothing. So it's something, it's it's not something, something to just ignore. Here is a plot of the probability mass function for this random variable. Uh, so enjoy that. <laughs> Here's the expected value and the variance. All right, next example. It is election night in the small town of Studentsville, and Jack, Jan uh, Jack Johnson is running for mayor against bitter rival John Jackson. Votes have been cast and are being counted. There are 1,024 ballots cast, and among the 200 ballots counted, 116 were cast for Jack Johnson. If the election were actually a tie, what would be the probability of observing 116 ballots or more cast for Jack Johnson? What does this say about who is likely winning the election? For this one, I didn't even really bother to go through the details of the mathematics. Uh, I just plugged it straight into P hyper. So what we're looking for is if in fact there are an equal number of votes for Jack Johnson and John Jackson, this corresponds to X following a hypergeometric distribution uh, uh, with parameters so let's see, they've counted 200 so far, so that's 200. Uh, so if they're equal, then we've got 512 votes for Jack uh, for uh, Jack Johnson and 1,024 votes in total. Uh, so that's what this translates into. And uh, if it were actually a tie, what would be the probability of observing 116 ballots or more for Jack Johnson? So we're asking for the probability that 
x is greater than or equal to 116. And that's what this function, and this that's what this uh, this uh, R code is computing. And what we get is 0 0.007. The idea of this problem is mostly to give you an idea of, like, let's say we're talking on, I mean, this is 2020. This is an election year. So in the United States, at least. And uh, you may be aware if you follow election news and stuff that on the night of the election, they're going to be casting uh, projections for states on who's likely to win that state. That's a very important part of the U.S. presidential election system, the Electoral College, who's winning what states. And you may wonder how it is that they know with very few votes who's likely to win. And this is basically saying that you don't really need all the votes in order to really know who won. In this case, if uh, there were 200 ballots counted uh, out of the 1,024, that's like 20%-ish of the total number of ballots. And it seems quite likely that this individual Jack Johnson is winning because if it were actually a tie, then getting this many votes or more for Jack Johnson is actually quite rare. So hence the example that said, there's additional complications when you're working with, uh, when you, when you're working with the uh, election results and you'll see them hold off a bit more uh, because not all votes are distributed the same when you count the first 500 votes of the votes in a state, actually those votes may be coming from specific precincts, which probably have different, which, so basically long story short, this is not an independent, identically distributed sample, uh, even amongst all possible combinations of votes at that, at that level. So anyway, I just, I just wanted to throw that out there because I am very much a political junkie. I care a great deal about American politics. So, Throwing political examples out there. I like doing that. All right. Anyway, uh, next next up, we talked about the hypergeometric distribution. I've given you a couple examples of working with the hypergeometric distribution. Uh, the next distribution I want to talk about is the negative binomial. So consider flipping a coin with probably P of landing heads up. All the flips are independent. Flip a coin until R heads have been seen and count the number of tails seen until the experiment ended. Let the random variable x represent this count. Then x follows the negative binomial distribution, or x uh, follows... Uh, then we could use the notation that I've written down on the screen. The probability mass function for x is... We'll use uh, lowercase nb to mean the probability mass function. x, we have the parameters r and p. Uh, r corresponds to... Uh, the number of successes to end the experiment. And P corresponds to uh, a probability of success. in one of these independent trials. So we've got uh, NBXRP. This is going to equal uh, X plus R minus one, choose R minus one. Uh, P to the power R because there were P successes and then one minus P to the power X because there were X failures. Okay, so the thing is about this random variable, it actually is very close to the geometric distribution that I was describing before. What differs mostly is the framing. I describe how this random variable can be related to the geometric distribution. With the geometric distribution, as I formulated it prior, I was including that final head. So I was counting the number of total flips. In this situation, we're counting only the number of failures. So if we were talking about the geometric distribution, you're basically guaranteed one success. So that would mean that uh, if you subtracted one 
from our geometric random variable, we would have a negative binomial random variable where r equals 1. So there is, in fact, a relationship between the two. In fact, you can view... Uh, it, is, it is reasonable to view a negative binomial random variable as the sum of some geometric random variables, uh, ignoring for the fact that difference in wording and that one counts, as, counts failures and the number of counts total flips. Um, because you can think of it as, all right, if we're going to get our successes from from flipping a coin what would we do well we first flip the coin until we get our first success then we flip the coin until we get our second success and we add together how many flips we've done then we flip the coin until we get our third success and add together add that to our total amount of flips and just keep doing that until we get our successes so whenever we get our first success we restart the entire process so that we can continue on until eventually we get our successes. So in a way, you get, um, I, I guess there is this little difference in that one counts successes and the other counts, or one counts um, failures and the other counts total flips, but then you could just like subtract R from your sum of geometric random variables and end up with the negative binomial. So in fact, a negative binomial can be seen as a sum of geometrics. And by the way, Recognizing random variables as being the sum of other random variables is very valuable. If you can do that, then you get to invoke the central limit theorem and say something about what this random variable will look like when one of its parameters gets large. I'm not going to talk about that because the central limit theorem is for chapter 5, but recognizing some random variables as sums of others is very important. And for that reason, the, the binomial distribution is also it's also a sum of random variables. It's a sum of Bernoulli's. So that's going to be rather important and it's going to have some deep implications for the behavior of binomial random variables. So uh, the expected value of this random variable, the expected value of x... I guess we're using blue now, is equal to r times 1 minus p over p. And the variance of x is r times 1 minus p over p squared. And in a way, those quantities, like let's, let remembering that I just said, that if you subtract one from a geometric random variable, you get a negative binomial with r parameter one. Okay, so the mean of a geometric random variable was one over p. So one over p minus one is going to be, oh, look at that, one minus p over p. Which is what's appearing right here. And kind of justifies if a, if a negative binomial were in fact viewable as a sum of geometrics, then what have we done? We've added up R geometrics, so we get to multiply that mean by R. And same thing is going on with the variance. Hmm. It's stuff like that that you want to pay attention to. All right. Uh, example 18. This is kind of a funny one. Uh, and I just, I can't think of anything... I, I can't do any other example. Sorry, guys. I just, I have to do this one. I must. It is a biological impulse. All right. Uh, example 18. A husband and wife plan to have children until they have exactly two boys. After this, they will set, they will stop attempting to have children. Assume that the probability of giving birth to a boy is 51%. I think this might actually be true. I heard someone say that, or I heard somewhere that the odds of, Male versus female is not actually 50%. It's like 51% in favor of male. I'm not entirely sure if this is true. If someone told me I'm, 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 just, I'm just blowing smoke, then I would believe them. Or, or well, I don't know. I, I, I shouldn't just believe what random people say. But you get, the, you get the idea. I'm very persuadable on this. I've heard something along the lines of it has to be 51% of boys. Otherwise, we'd run out of men. Because men also die sooner. Um, I don't know. I've just heard something like this. That it might be true. But mostly I just want to keep away from one half. 
Because sometimes one half can trivialize things. Um, all right. So what is the probability they will have two girls before uh, stopping, before ceasing to attempt to have more children? So this is going to be the probability mass function of the negative binomial because what they're what we're asking for is the probability that the number of I guess having a girl is a failure. <laughs> Uh, the probability that x is equal to 2, the number of failures is equal to 2. So this is going to be the negative binomial at 2. We have parameters. Uh, they want two boys, and uh, the probability of getting a boy is 0.51. So this is going to be, according to our formula from above, 2 plus 2 minus 1. Choose 2 minus 1 times 0.51 squared times 0.49 squared. And that comes out to be, uh, I'm just gonna skip all that work and just move right straight to the punchline. This is gonna be 0 0.187350003 and you can confirm the details for yourself at this point i would hope that you're comfortable working with n choose k and that you're also comfortable with multiplication exponents and stuff like that so that's what it's going to be what is the probability they will need at least four children all right this is pro this is asking for the probability that the number of girls plus two because there will be two boys is greater than or equal to 4, which is going to be the probability that x is greater than or equal to 2. And I mean, that would be really hard to compute if we try to compute it directly. So we're instead going to say that this is going to be 1 minus the probability that x is less than 2, which is equal to 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 1, which is going to be one minus uh, the probability mass function at zero plus the probability mass function at one. Okay, so uh, we need to figure out what the probability mass function at those points actually is. So the probability that x is equal to zero, or uh, let's 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 save some space. Uh, so the probability mass function at zero, uh, two point five one, is going to be uh, in the end one choose one. After you apply that formula from the uh, from the uh, what do you call it? Uh, oh yeah, that that I had above. Uh, for the probability mass function. And then we've got 0.51 squared and 0.49 to the zeroth power because there are zero girls in this scenario. They got two boys right away. And this is going to be point, just in the end, 0.51 squared, which is 0.2601. And the negative binomial at one it's probably mass function at one that is is going to be two choose one, which is two. Uh, 0 0.51 squared times uh, 0 0.49 to the first power because now there's one girl, and this is going to be after you do the work. Uh, 0.254898. So in the end, the quantity that we actually wanted to compute will be 1 minus 0 0.2601 plus 0 0.254898, which is going to be 0 0.485002. 
All right, next example. What is the expected number of children they will have? What is the variance of this random variable? Uh, so the expected number of children, remember that the number of children is x plus 2 since x counts only girls. So that's going to be the expected value of x plus 2, which is 2 times 1 minus 0.51 over 0.51 plus 2 uh, which is going to be 2 times 0.49 over 0.51 plus 2 you can imagine that if we said that the odds of getting a boy and a girl were 50 50 it would you would end up with four but because boys are just slightly more likely you get uh, approximately 3.9 for the expected number. Now for the variance of the number of children. The variance of x plus 2? Well, the plus 2 doesn't actually matter, and we've talked about this when talking about the variance, that you can change the location of your random variable and the variance will stay the same. So this is equal to the variance of x. And that's going to be... 2 times 1 minus 0.51 over 0.51 squared. Uh, that is exactly uh, 9,800 over 2601. Don't ask me how I got that. Which is going to be approximately 3.8. So 3.8 children squared, whatever a child squared is. And this is what we get. Uh, so the R functions responsible for working with the negative binomial are the n binom class of functions. So we've got dn binom, and this is asking for the probability that we get two uh, girls uh, before we ended up having two boys, giving it the number of successes we're going to end up uh, having in the end, and also the probability of a single success. Uh, here is working with the CDF to get the probability that we need at least uh, that we're go going to have at least four children. From this point on, uh, I create a random variable representing uh, this uh, this distribution. I actually plotted its probability mass function, and I computed its expected value and variance. That's it for this section. That's it for what I have to say about negative binomials and hypergeometrics. So I will see you in the uh, last section's video where I'm talking about Poisson random variables and Poisson processes. Okay, I will see you there.